Hyvää huomenta. Tervetuloa mukaan Eurooppa-foorumin toiseen päivään. Minä olen Josefina Tuomala ja toimin tänään lavajuontajananne. Aamun ensimmäisen ohjelman jälkeen tällä lavalla on luvassa muun muassa Esko luonto sekä puhetta EU-investoinneista ja ilmastopolitiikasta. Kaikki sisällöt livestriimataan ja suomenkielinen ohjelmasisältö tulkataan englanniksi. Seuraavaan paneelin kieli tulee olemaan englanti, joten jatkan juonnon loppuun englannin kielellä. Good morning and welcome to the second day of this year's Europe Forum in Turku. For three days the Turku City Theatre is filled with discussions about the secure future of Europe. All programs are live streamed and Finnish programs are simultaneously interpreted into English. The chat is open. If you want to participate in the discussion, there is a QR code on the screen that will take you straight to the chat. Next up, the first program session of today. Where is European competitiveness headed? The future of investments and innovations in Europe. is brought to you by the Business Turku and Turku Chamber of Commerce. Welcome. Uh, dear guests, welcome to the Economic Day at the uh, Turku Europe Forum. My name is Tapani Mylly. I work as a Chief of Marketing uh, at uh, Business Turku. It is my great, great pleasure to open this session at a topic that is both timely and crucial. Where is European competitiveness headed? As we gather today, Europe finds itself at a crossroads. The global landscape is shifting rapidly driven by technological advancements, geopolitical tensions and the urgent need for sustainable development. These changes pose both challenges and opportunities for all of us. Uh, today's discussion will delve into the factors shaping Europe's future competitiveness, ranging from industrial strategies and digital transformation to regulatory environments and global trade dynamics. It is an opportunity to reflect not only on where we are, but where we need to go. I look forward to stimulating discussion and to hearing insights on how we can navigate this new landscape together. Once again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. To open up the day, I would like to invite on stage Mr. Reijo Kempinen, who has decades of experience on working for the EU. Welcome. Thank you very much, and it's so very nice to be here, and so very nice to see also that uh, many of you have uh, not only woken up early to this beautiful morning in Turku, but also found your way to this exciting opening of the day. The Polish presidency of the Council of the European Union, uh, starting 1st of January 2025, I've seen during those decades that I've worked for the European Union, not all countless many, but many, many, many presidencies of the Council, but hardly ever one that takes place as this exceptionally challenging time. Uh, it takes against the background of things that we know, geopolitical instability, security concerns, not only Russia's aggressive war in Ukraine and against Ukraine and against democracy itself, but also the tensions with China, EU-NATO relations, the building work ongoing, migration asylum policy, the challenges laid there to all of us and the presidency as well, energy policy, green transition, the continuation of Fit for 55 package, economic governance, the questions about the future of the reform of the Growth and Stability Pact, enlargement, relations with our neighboring countries in more general, and then the onslaught of populism and Euroscepticism that can be partly seen also as results of the recent European Parliament elections and the new kind of uh, dynamics within the Parliament that the Polish presidency is going to test for real for the first time on behalf of us all. Now, there's no one better to talk about these things and also better to do that than Agnieszka Bartol Sohel who is a state secretary at the Chancellor of the Prime Minister. 
She has extensive experience of the European Union as well. She's a graduate of the University of Nancy in France, as well as the College of Europe in Natalin. She worked at the College of Europe, as well as the Office of the Committee for the European Integration in Poland. And in 2002, as the only representative of the country succeeding to the European Union, she was a member of the Secretariat of the Convention, working directly with the former President of France, uh, uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. From there, she joined the team in the, European, in the Council of the European Union, where she was first involved in the work on the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, and since 2003, she has worked in the Council, specializing in many different files like in cohesion policy, financial services, institutional affairs, and the multi-annual financial framework, which again is something very topical for the presidency of the Polish, uh, uh, Polish presidency of, of the Council. And in 2016, she was working for the head of the cabinet of the Secretary General, and in November 22, she became a Director General, only to be called back to serve her country. Um, when Donald Tusk calls, I hope uh, you can't say no, and she didn't say no. So she took a hit on behalf of her country, on behalf of Europe, and became the State Secretary. And then we'll see what the consequences of that are going to be. But as I said, there's no one better to speak about these things. She could do it in English, she could do it in French, but she could also do it in Polish and in Russian and in Italian. So unfortunately today we have only interpretation between English and Finnish, so I'm not going to ask her to kind of uh, lure you and attract you with these kind of, uh, characteristics. But with this I lay the ground for Agnieszka, uh, I'm not sure whether she can talk about the priorities as they are, because the, as you all know, the situation in Poland, the recent change of government and the one that they left behind and the one that is now leading the way, there is quite a big difference between those two. So I'm not surprised at all if there's still plenty of work to do before they can finalize their priorities. But we all look forward to hearing what you have to say on this matter. Agnieszka, please. Hello, and thank you very much, Raya. I actually, and thank you also for, I think I have your phone here. Do you need it? No. Uh, uh, I can't speak Finnish, though. So uh, I won't be able to, uh, I will need translate. I won't be able to, uh, to, uh, to talk to you in Finnish. But uh, uh, what Raya said about me so kindly is actually reminding me, I mean, letting me to tell you something very personal. Uh, to start with, and to thank, you, and to share a story to to thank you for having me here. Um, I was born in the 70s, and I was born um, in Europe, but very, very far away from the European Union. What became later the European Union. Uh, so I started my European experience uh, as as a dream about. Um, I continued this European experience as preparing for the dream to come true. Uh, and at a certain point, the dream has come true, uh, and the reality also came true. Uh, and what I will be talking about today, uh, I think will show you that uh, the dream and reality can, can actually come together, uh, provided we also have in mind that, uh, that, everything, that, that lots of things are unpredictable, but it would, what is really important is to do things together. So thank you, thank you, thank you again, and sorry for this personal comment, but, but you triggered it, actually, Rayo. Um, well, yes, on the 1st of January, Poland will, will uh, take over the presidency of the Council of the European Union. Uh, it will be our 21st year of, uh, after accession. Uh, it will be our second presidency, uh, which is nearly unbelievable when you think of the fact that only 20 years ago we joined the Union. Uh, when you start planning a presidency, you have sort of three categories of issues that you, um, that, you, that you plan on the basis of which you plan. One is the knowns, the other is the known unknowns, and the third one is the unknown unknowns. Uh, the known are straightforward. They are uh, easy to plan, even though they are hard to deliver. Uh, by the end of this year, we will know where we are in terms of advanced legislative work, what the previous presidencies have done, what they haven't done, 
uh, where we will need to hit uh, start discussions with the European Parliament, where we will need to continue them, etc. We also have the political guidelines which, are pre which were presented by the President of the Commission. Uh, and we will work on this basis. We know which initiatives will be coming uh, in the coming months, and we will be happy to, to, to work very intensely on them. We were super happy to see that the President of the Commission had concentrated a lot on what you are actually concentrating on today, competitiveness, economy, defence. Um, so this is actually a planning which is quite straightforward, not necessarily easy to deliver because you need to negotiate on behalf of 27, you need to find agreements within and, um, and institutions and among the institutions. But you know, it is, it is a relatively um, foreseeable and predictable process. Then you have the known unknowns. The known unknowns is what I call the known unknowns, is when you have a framework, an environment which exists, but you don't know in which way it will evolve. And I will give you two, two, major, um, two major examples. The first one is, of course, uh, the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we all know where we are at this stage. Uh, we know that it's an absolute priority. We know that it has transformed our thinking. Uh, it has actually, an there is an existential dimension for us, for you, for the European Union. But of course, we don't know in which way it will evolve. I mean, I guess that we all share here the, the, the wish that, um, that Ukraine will uh, get a victory of this war. But we, will know, we don't know when, and we don't know in which path it will evolve. And therefore, uh, what, wherever it evolves, it will remain on the absolute top of the EU agenda. It will shape the European Union policies, but we don't know in which, in which direction yet exactly. Another example, of course, and then you will not be surprised, the results of the US elections. We know when they take place, but we don't know which results we will have. So is it going to be the continuation of the uh, policy of, of, of the European Union transatlantic policy? Is it going to be a disruption? We don't know that yet, but whatever the evolution is, the Union needs to be prepared for any scenario. And whatever evolution, I think that we can be uh, absolutely sure that transatlantic relations will remain extremely important for the European Union and will remain high on, on our agenda. Um, the last category is, um, is the one that I call the unknown unknowns. Since it's an unknown unknowns, I will not dwell a lot about it. But to give you two examples, first, um, do you think the Croatian presidency was expecting to have a pandemic and lockdowns at the very beginning, actually, of its start? No. Did the French, when they were preparing their priorities of their program, foresee that there would be a war just behind our border? Of course not. And this is the part of the presidency, which, of the presidency preparations that I think every administration fears the most, uh, and, but also uh, prepares for the most. Of course, not in terms of substance, because there is little you can do without knowing, but in terms of agil agility, uh, adaptability, and the flexibility in pr your procedures and in your thinking so that you can adapt to any, uh, any circumstances. But after having said this, uh, this, how we prepare, I think that now you can actually even better understand why I cannot be very specific about the priorities of the European Union, uh, of the Polish presidency. Um, it would be silly to tell you four months before uh, what, will be, uh, what, will, what exactly will be the details of the program. Uh, but what I would like to, to present to you is uh, where our thinking is going, where, what drives our thinking, thinking forward. Uh, you will also see that sometimes I will be focusing more maybe on the diagnosis than on the solutions. Um, why? Because I believe that solutions need to come from a common thinking. No individual member states have, have solutions to most of problems which are becoming, um, which are becoming common. Uh, so I hope to have the solutions including with you, including in our discussion, uh, but certainly uh, by, by cooperating and working together uh, with colleagues within the, within the Council. Uh, our, the start of our thinking actually is uh, always starts, and as politicians we should always probably start with, with citizens. 
So when you look at the Eurobarometer from, from this year, meaning what are the, what are the biggest challenges that the, the European citizens see, uh, among the top five you find irregular migration, security and defense, the war in Ukraine. Um, you also have environment and climate and public health. Uh, what is the common denominator of all these challenges? I think it's security. Security uh, in very different aspects. And taking into account our own Polish, but uh, I'm sure that you will be able to relate to it quite, quite a lot, uh, historical and current geopolitical situation, uh, I believe that we, unfortunately, uh, have a great lot of experience to share in terms of strengthening security and caring about security. Um, we constantly face uh, consequences of the Russian aggression, as, as Ray also mentioned. Uh, we experience bombings, you know, kilometer, not, not far away from our borders, um, intelligence activities, uh, cyber attacks, hybrid attacks, disinformation. Um, we had to entirely redefine our own energy mix uh, in order to get independent from, from Russia. Uh, so I think that we are actually well placed to talk about security and to promote security uh, in Europe. And we are actually very happy also to note that the President of the Commission has put this as security in large sense on the top of the agenda. So what are we talking about when we talk about security? We are actually not talking only about military security and defence and security, but that's where I will start. Because uh, defence and security is actually... Um, probably the overriding principle, the overriding security. I mean, if you don't have that one, you cannot pretend or you cannot aspire to have the other forms of security that, that I'll talk about. Um, and here, of course, the top priority and top issue of that, that, that we will be working on is, is support to Ukraine. Uh, the EU has, has made a very firm commitment to support Ukraine. We will support Ukraine as long as it takes and as intensely as needed. There is no doubt about it. Um, but at the same time, we need to build the security of the EU itself. The EU defense industry is obviously crucial. I mean, we've been talking about it a lot recently. Uh, but the industry is a mean, right? It cannot function by itself. It, I mean, it's not enough by itself. What we need is um, we need defense industry in order to achieve a real defense readiness in Europe. I know that I am talking to a very, uh, very uh, aware audience here. Uh, and when I'm talking in my country, it's a very aware audience as well, because we are frontline member states. We have been living in this reality for two years. Uh, but I think that uh, the raising of the awareness has started relatively recently in all parts um, of the European Union. What is our diagnosis there? Um, we need to out-of-the-box thinking. Uh, we, as, and especially regarding financial solutions. Uh, for many, many years, uh, we have been under-investing, both politically, when I say we, it's not necessarily you or uh, Poland, but rather the, the EU as a whole. We have been under-investing both politically and financially. Uh, you may remember that for historical reasons, even the treaty doesn't foresee that, um, or quite, the, quite the, not even doesn't foresee, but forbids uh, operational military expenditure. Um, but... So we need to think out of the box because we're not going to change the treaty, of course, on this aspect. So uh, we, need to, we need to think out of the box. What does, and we need to do it quickly. We cannot wait until the next multi-annual financial framework because Putin will not wait. And if you ask me what are the solutions, I will ask you what are the solutions. I think that we should be open to any solutions provided that we can... Uh, find uh, additional financing. As you know, the European Council has tasked the President of the Commission to work on it, uh, and we as the Presidency are going certainly to, to work very hard to, to make it happen, because we believe this is an existential uh, issue for the European Union. Uh, but of course, why, why do we need financing? For what we need financing? Yes, we need European projects. Uh, and, and here we are, as Poland, uh, has, have, uh, the Prime Minister Tusk has, has proposed together with uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis, the Greek Prime Minister, a project for the defense of the sky, 
the European Air Defence Shield. Uh, and together with, uh, with the Baltic states, Prime Minister Tusk has proposed what we call Shield East, which is aligned with the Baltic defence line, the defence of the borders. Defence of the borders, uh, and that's what brings me to the next point on security. Um, may, may, may just, just coming back to, to, to defence and security. So, uh, strengthening defence resilience, not only defence industry, but of course it goes through defence industry. Um, financing, clear purpose, projects, and all of this uh, in order to be able also to be a fundamental, um, even more fundamental pillar of NATO, to reinforce our European pillar of NATO. And here actually when uh, I'm really happy I'm talking to you because uh, the report of uh, President Ninista will, will feed into our reflection and work very much. So we're waiting for it with, uh, with impatience. Uh, that brings me to the second aspect of security, which is the security of borders. Uh, I don't think that uh, anybody more than you can understand what I mean. Uh, we are at, uh, in a situation where our borders, both yours and ours, are external, East, but these are EU external borders, are under extreme pressure, which, which is actually a hybrid attack. It's not uh, a natural uh, migration uh, phenomenon. It's an organized uh, by state actors, an organized uh, migration phenomenon, or how you call it. It's an attack. Uh, from which that, that we need to uh, that we need to deal with. Um, I have just mentioned the defense aspect of the of the of the borders, but uh, it's not only it's not only about defense aspects. Of course, it's also on how we handle this kind of migration, which has become a weaponization of migration. We have for a long time we've been talking about instrumentalization of migration, but the level has has gone up. So uh, we are now talking rather about weaponization. How do we how would how do we deal with it? What which procedures do we uh, do we introduce? Uh, what are because we we are not in a typical situation that many of our of our colleagues in the European Union know. We cannot negotiate. We don't have anybody to negotiate with a deal or an agreement or a readmission. Um, so this is certainly going also to you. Um, we work together with you and with other other member states on possible ways to 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 secure and to, to protect the, the the borders as well. Um, another aspect of, of uh, security is energy security, which we will certainly certainly work on. I mean, the experience of the 22 uh, and following uh, energy crisis have learned us lots of lessons. We have uh, we as the union have already. Uh, Gone a lot uh, in um, in the direction of uh, of securing stocks, of uh, securing uh, uh, independence, um, uh, energy independence, in uh, securing, trying to secure affordable prices, etc. But it, we are not flawless. This is not enough. Uh, so energy security, and and when you look at uh, what citizens uh, fear the most. Energy is at the top of their uh, of their uh, concerns. Energy prices, energy availability. Um, here we will need to, because the crisis did not go away. What what we think that um, that uh, that the EU should be focusing on now even more is, uh, of course, in addition to a technology neutral energy transition striving even more for the independence from suppliers of energy, raw materials and energy technologies from third, unreliable third countries. Um, and our priority as Poland has been and will be certainly, and that's how we see also the, the priority for the EU, is to minimize the dependence on other countries without compromising the availability, reliability and, and affordability of energy. Um, another aspect of security, you will see that this common denominator of security is we are, we are declining it in our thinking about the presidency into different areas. Uh, another one which you are actually uh, talking about today is competitiveness, is a sort of economic and business security. Uh, we are, the EU is under growing economic pressure from, from global competitors. Um, and in order to reinforce the strand in its clouds, it has to uh, it has to invest more in competitiveness. 
Uh, I can tell you from, from our own experience that our 20 years experience in the European Union uh, confirms that the participation in the single market have contributed in, 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 in a, just in, in a valuable way uh, to bring us closer to the level of, of prosperity of the countries of the West. Um, so the single market should be back on the agenda, should be back to uh, discuss the removal of barriers. I mean, when you think of it, we've been talking about removal of barriers to the single market for how many years? 20? I mean, we are still there. Of course, the single market and the market and economy is evolving. Uh, but, uh, but it's true that you see, you see the same issues uh, being back, back on, the, on, the, on the scene. Um, removing barriers, reducing costs, reducing bureaucratic burdens. I was talking with uh, SMEs yesterday for whom this was absolutely crucial, the top of their priorities. Um, ensuring a level playing field within the EU, but also um, outside. Uh, improving access to private and public capital. Well, you know all of this, and I'm not, I don't want to anticipate your, your future discussions of today, but uh, just to mention that this is, again, another dimension of security which will be very important for us. Uh, and, coming, and within this is, of course, uh, as Enrico Letta told yesterday, a cohesion policy, and in his report, that cohesion policy uh, was put in place as a fundamental element of the single market, not outside of this framework. Uh, and this is also part of this economic and business security for us, and a trigger of competitiveness. Information security next. Uh, I know that I'm talking to an audience which is probably more um, in information security and digital uh, than any other in, uh, in the EU. Um, but of course, it, com it makes our lives easier. It, uh, it's, it brings new, uh, new opportunities, but it brings also new dilemmas. It brings also new challenges. Uh, both in terms of access and, and proliferation of information, but also the vulnerability of infrastructure. Uh, what we will want to look at uh, is, uh, and what we are looking at there, is uh, strengthening, co enhancing coordination in the fight against disinformation, uh, preventing and mitigating the effects of hostile actions, cyber attacks, etc. Um, and this we can only do together, actually. This is something, again, which, uh, which we only can do together. Um, food security, another very important, uh, very important issue of security. Uh, you have seen, we all have seen uh, agricultural protests uh, a few months ago. Uh, this, was not, th th this, this has shown us uh, where how much food security is actually fragile and how, how we need to take care of it. And we can only ensure it if farmers have a strong and stable position in the food chain. Why? Also because, as actually the President of the Commission has said as well, uh, we have an extremely high quality of food for citizens and we, should try to, we have to maintain that. Um, but when we talk about strengthening security, uh, there is also an even broader meaning. Uh, and it comes through upholding the fundamental values uh, on which the, the EU is funded. Democracy, freedom, rule of law. We see the rule of law as, as the pillar of stability and trust uh, between the member states, uh, and therefore a guarant guarantor of security. And believe me, we know what we are talking about. Uh, the existing procedures provide the Commission with a useful set of tools, um, but uh, also, but, but, but it should be broadened, and the President of the Commission has, has already announced it. Uh, but though, uh, we are going, I mean, for us, the rule of law and the protection of rule of law and the security linked to that and, and sort of defined from going out of it uh, will be one of the fundamental light motives of the whole, uh, the whole presidency. We will also work, of course, on the initiative uh, announced by the presidency in other areas, uh, especially when, um, when, they, uh, when we count on the commission to provide us input, like on enlargement, uh, where we hope to, to receive the report of the commission, certainly on reforms, 
uh, obviously on climate policy. Here maybe I will uh, take this occasion also to, uh, to say a few words about climate policy. Uh, climate policy is indispensable. I know that there are lots of uh, uh, doubts or maybe hesitations in the public domain about the Polish uh, attitude towards climate policy. It is indispensable. Uh, nobody disputes that. What we need, we believe we need, a fair and encouraging climate and environmental policy. A policy which changes gear from penalties and obligations to rewards and uh, incentives. Um, a policy which consolidates, but also brings means to accompany the transition. And that's what we are going to uh, promote in the EU as, as Poland. Not necessarily, um, not, I mean, that, that, that will be our stance. But I wanted to clarify that because I hear, even in discussions yesterday, I've heard a lot about, uh, about what, what is the perception of what we think about, about climate policy. Um, I think I'll stop there, but I wanted to, I just wanted to insist that uh, what I presented are not the presidency priorities, because these will come to maturity probably towards the end of the year. Uh, these are rather, rather directions of thinking and the sort of broad environment which we are, in which we are framing the priorities. Um, and yes, it is about security. It is about security in many aspects, uh, a security which protects not a security which scares. Thank you. Should I sit here? Maybe, maybe I don't want to keep uh, uh, Professor Lee Makiyama waiting too long, but I think there's one pertinent question. I promised you already earlier that uh, I will more ask you of this in the personal capacity, but I think it's uh, given your experience, but I think it's a relevant question given everything else that is going to be discussed today including the question of the treaty changes in the afternoon. I mean, you look at the size of the challenge ahead of us, not least for the Polish presidency, the amount of time available to you to meet those challenges, the unpredictable of the knowns, the unknowns, etc., etc. Do you think that there's a chance that we can maintain European unity and, uh, and uh, surpass all these challenges without touching the question of the treaties that nobody seems to want to even discuss? No pressure at all, huh? Uh, well, I think that... Uh, I mean, that, actually, you, you, you touched upon two issues. One issue is unity. Uh, it has been our strength, and probably the biggest strength, uh, throughout the whole development of the European Union, but in times of crisis, uh, it has become absolutely crucial. When you look at the, um, the institutional setup and at the um, legacy that President Tusk in particular, when President of the European Council, has left, I think the unity is a light motive, is a sort of fil conducteur, as you would say in French, of all his actions, but also uh, of his successor. Uh, and uh, the, I think that some of us, though, you know, in Brussels inside us, uh, get surprised sometimes of how we manage to maintain unity in, uh, when discussing and we're deciding and taking measures in areas which, where we have completely divergent interests. Completely. Um, how we had to come together and, I mean, look at what happened when, the, when the Russia uh, attacked Ukraine. I mean, the shift in uh, national positions, but also in the common EU um, uh, thinking and doing is fundamental. Look at, uh, at NGU, the post-COVID. Could you imagine 10 years ago, I see some... Uh, some uh, former Brussels insiders here, who, could you imagine 20, 30 years ago that we would do common borrowing? I mean, seriously? This, this, has, this unity, why? Because there is a sense of purpose. There is a se I am deeply convinced that there is a sense of um, if we do things together, we actually will achieve more. And I think that the, actually the, 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 what has also uh, been clear is the fundamental role of the European Council in that. 
uh, a European Council where you have the heads of state and or government of all the member states and the president of the commission, who is the member of the institution, who discuss together. Sometimes you see it, uh, they spend whole nights there, but they nearly always come to a conclusion. Well, they actually always come to a conclusion, uh, sooner or later, uh, because there is a sense of purpose and a sense of, of responsibility that they have on, on their shoulders. On treaty change, uh, there is a lot of talk about treaty change. Uh, I am actually not convinced that this is something that our citizens are the most in interested in. I'm not sure the person on the street over the, you know, walking by the river wonders which, uh, how many commissioners there should be or by which uh, majority we should, uh, voting system, you know, we should have. Uh, this is a little bit a bubble, uh, a bubble uh, discussion. This, this treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, has been set up in, st in institutional terms in order to be enlargement proof. That's why there, is, uh, there are different provisions in this treaty which allow you to, um, to take over new members, to take in new member states without, uh, without the need of changing the institutional, uh, the institutional setup. The treaty itself, well, sometimes we say, well, just read the treaty. The treaty itself uh, has lots of potential for uh, flexibilities, which we are not really using. So, I actually, and I don't actually see a huge appetite for treaty discussions, for tr treaty change discussions. I mean, it has, last time it has been on the agenda of the Council or European Council was in December 23, but just sort of as a transmission of the parliament, um, parliament uh, position to the European Council. The European Council has not discussed it yet. The Council has not discussed it. Uh, I'm not sure there is any appetite to, to get into this discussion. But at the end of the process, so, so I, I, well, I actually am nearly sure there is no appetite. Uh, so I'm not fearing this discussion. And at the end of the day, treaty changes belong to member states. This is, uh, that's how the treaty is constructed. Thank you. Thank you, Aniska, very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. And uh, I hope that you take note of these words. This comes also from one of these invisible pen holders who penned the current <laughs> treaty. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Is this yours? No. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, our second keynote speaker is a recurring guest here at uh, Europe Forum. And uh, last time he gave an almost harrowing uh, keynote on the dynamics of Europe and uh, China and the United States in international business. Uh, backstage he was saying that he likes to be so direct that he never gets invited back, but maybe he underestimated the directness of, of us Finns. So I would very very warmly welcome on the stage, uh, Professor Hosokli Makiyama. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed true. It's the second time I'm here. And uh, indeed, I was very, very surprised. Because you know what they say about keynotes? You do them twice in your career. First time when you're new and fresh and you have new brilliant ideas uh, to bring to the table. Second time when you're past your prime and you're actually a little bit of an embarrassment and it's great to be back. <laughs> <laughs> and with that said, and also I would like to thank uh, Agnieszka for a brilliant speech and uh, I hope there will be some kind of a record of it because th there's a lot of things there in between the lines and Certainly, there was a lot of sufficient line space in order to decode what you're saying. And I will also pick up on some of that. And I think we have a lot of common experiences, both from Brussels and the member states. And uh, once again, a great honor. And we have a very competent panel. So I'm merely going to try to set the stage as much as I can in the short period of time that we have to cover a very topical issue, which is about competitiveness. And this is something that really, really raises the back hair of a lot of finance ministers and trade ministers and industry ministers nowadays. Because let's face it, let's face it in, as Europeans, in any long-term projection, Europe will be lagging towards the rest of the world. We used to be 25% of the global GDP 20 years ago. Now we are down to 17. 
So we kind of lose approximately 3-4% per decade. And I would like to argue this is, there are good and perfectly natural reasons behind this. We are not necessarily falling behind, but the rest of the world is catching up. And if you believe that the Chinese and the Brazilians and the Indians love their children as much as we love our children, um, no pun intended about the state of our daycare system, but uh, if we believe so, this is inevitable and this is going to happen. Now, Europe was first industrialized, and this first mover advantage was used to create a global empires and global supply chains. And whereas the rest of the world is still catching up, actually, from the self-imposed handicaps that were actually great European inventions uh, that were exported abroad. So colonialism and communism, just to take two examples. And uh, what we see, for example, in China is basically still a recovery from the period where they were actually playing tennis with just one hand. This is what we are basically seeing. So we shouldn't be too alarmed about the fact that the rest of the world is catching up and growing much faster than we do. This is not naturally a problem. It's the natural law. It's not a problem as long as we have access to the growth that happens elsewhere. Right. And, but there is another dimension of the competitiveness problem, uh, which concerns me a little bit, which is about productivity. GDP is a measure of how much you produce, but productivity is how productive you are which has nothing to do with our wages, it has nothing to do with the dumping, but it's basically how much is the value of one hour worked for a European worker or American worker. And it needs to be said that Europe was ahead of the United States until 1944, 1945, they overtook us. And since, the United States have remained in the frontier. An average US worker, one hour worked, generates about $77. Europe never surpassed $70. That basically means that an American worker is 10% more efficient than we are. And there is a very good reason for that. And just to give a little bit of a benchmark before we panic too much about China, a Chinese worker generates about $15. So they are less than one-fourth of still of an OECD worker. And this gap between the United States and Europe is 100% explained by technological adaptation. This is something that productivity economists have looked into into details. It is due to the fact that an American auto worker, chemical plant worker, or public servant, or an accountant is better adapted for the technological reality that prevails today. They have a better propensity to learn ICT technology than we do. And that's basically the 100%. And there's actually very good research done by EIB, uh, European Investment Bank, on this, where America is actually ahead of Europe in terms of adapting new technology. And it's actually pretty somber reading. Cloud, big data, AI, on every emerging technology, United States is ahead in terms of how much, what's the percentage of workers and companies that are actually using such technologies. The only area we actually catch up with Americans is, strange enough, metaverse. You know those virtual reality goggles? So apparently we are very good at that. <laughs> and there, there's actually a good reason behind that as well, because they're actually done to create prototypes of new products, uh, in, for example, in the auto industry. So rather than building prototypes, you do them virtually now in the, in the goggles, and therefore there is an incentive for a certain part of the European industry to be very, very good at it. There are also other reasons and, uh, which differentiate us from the United States, and here's where it gets a little bit difficult, because in the United States, you have a less rigid uh, uh, market in terms of labor, which basically the people go in and out of jobs. They change directions in their careers, even late, Whereas in Europe, we have structural unemployment. That means that the most unproductive workers are actually permanently taken away from the labor market. What does it mean? Actually, our labor productivity is even lower than the 10% gap. 
There are also other reasons. We are smaller countries. We work less. That means, for example, if you work 10 hours, I swear to you that the 10th hour, hour is less productive than the first one. Sweden, where I come from, uh, sorry, I won't be doing this speech in Tvångsvenska. Uh, I respect the host. But basically, if you have a, let's say, four hour working day, you're going to be pretty productive on the four hours. And this is, for example, the reason why the Asians really hate labor productivity per hour as a measure. They measure it per day. They love to spend 14 days, uh, sorry, 14 hours at work because they can't stand their spouses and children. So um, anyway, uh, to, uh, to be perfectly said, what I'm saying is that in terms of productivity, yes, technology is the answer. And this is the reason, for example, where you see Chinese and Indians really look into techno-solutionism. Basically, they go all in on trying to adapt as much technology as possible, trying to catch up. Now, this is the productivity side, and it actually spills over an innovation. Because what I'm trying to say here is that we might be panicking about how China, uh, as the factory of the world, is actually doing extraordinarily well. The Chinese EVs are really, indeed, impressive. But even here, productivity plays a role. One hour worked in a lab in China is not the same as one hour worked spent here in Finland. We are still more productive. At the same time, I have been invited to Shenzhen and look at, for example, some of the, uh, the Chinese high-tech companies, and I've also seen what they do in Bangalore, in India, and even in the pharmaceutical industry. For example, uh, Chinese are spending a lot of money on genome sequencing. And where we have on a large, let's say, pharmaceutical company in Europe, we might have 10 high school graduates going through DNA sequencing to try to find a cure for a drug. A Chinese medium-sized pharmaceutical would have 100 PhDs doing the same job. Inevitably, at some point, we can't take for granted that one hour work, sorry, one day worked in Finland is going to generate the same kind of results as one day worked in Shenzhen. That will not hold. So we have, based on this, uh, we have to take stock. Where are we in terms of European innovation and competitiveness? And my take to cut the chase a little bit is that we are very good at foundational research. We are very good at doing research in universities, but we are not adapted to a reality where this research from the so-called RTOs, research technology organizations, has to be transferred to a product and commercialized. Some of the best marketeers in the world are European. We are great at creating spin but we are basically lacking that step between transforming know-how into products. Somewhere along the line, we lost that juice, which is kind of frightening. And I think the best example of this came into the fore uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine, the MRA vaccines, purely European invention. It was even scaled here in Europe, but all the vaccines ended up in American multinationals and bought by the American and British advanced purchase agreements. And this is perhaps the most defining moment, I think, in terms of European competitiveness and what the current political cycle is actually about. So, in short, we are great at innovating, but not very good at commercializing. And European approach has its limits. If I I'm, happen to be one of the evaluators of some of these EU funding projects, and what I can see is that we have a lot of restrictions and limitation in terms of how we can collaborate in Europe. It's great to have public funding, but if the public funding tells you that you actually have to share the research for public good, it makes less sense. Why would I spend my R&D resources, even if the government covers, let's say, 30% of the cost, 
if I have to share them with my competitors. Chinese and the Americans, especially the Biden administration, is giving cash directly into the hands of the CEO. That sounds a lot better, doesn't it? So this is the reality we are facing. And the collaborative ab approach and uh, the, um, the European innovation has sort of hit a snag. And um, this brings me to the question about funding and financing. And I absolutely agree that NG, EU, the EU financing and the EU bonds were a huge success. We did the unthinkable. And this is what I love about the EU. We kind of sleepwalk into disasters like Srebrenica or Ukraine. And most global powers leaders would say that we actually create our own problems. But we always do the unthinkable. We created EU financing, and if I look at the EU bonds that were issued, we are looking at 0.2% yield, which is actually quite decent for a government bond. And they were oversubscribed by 11 times. But none of the people who actually went into this fund and who bought the bonds were non-Europeans. They were primarily European institutions. And a friend of mine working in the European Commission actually asked some of the sovereign wealth funds and the central banks in Asia and the United States. Um, we are very happy, 11 times over subscription. We, we are not unhappy at all. But why aren't you investing in Europe? And one guy from Singapore actually raised his hand and said, you know what? My investment managers need to deliver 7%. If they go into a bond that creates 0.2%, he's just increasing the likelihood of getting fired. We have a great system to make our markets safe and remove unnecessary risk, de-risking. But in that process, we have also removed the profits out of the single market. And we have already traditionally problem with risk, uh, well, private equity and venture capital simply because we have a system that is based around banks. If I look at my home country of Sweden, which I love to criticize, uh, I may take up on an offer on political asylum at the end of this, but uh, in Sweden, uh, you know, the only way to get funded is actually by getting a bank loan. And banks are not typically, uh, or, or it's not even the banks, it's actually a couple of industrial conglomerates that control banks and thereby control a large part of the, the, the manufacturing and the service industry. And that has this kind of a system, the so-called arm length financing, <sighs> create a system that is not usually betting against the odds, against high risk and high rewards. And this is basically the end result of what we have created in the European model. So basically, single market don't reward risk taking. And the gap that has been created is now suddenly expected to be filled by whom? The government. There are some odd peculiar similarities between us and China, which I'm not 100% comfortable with. I'm going to stop there. But when it comes to the single market, we have always rewarded scale. It's great to be big, but it's not necessarily great to take risk. And there's a natural reason for that as well. Consumers are willing to pay the lowest price. This is the basic principle of public procurement as well as industry procurement and supply chain and how we behave with consumers. We are not ready to pay for convenience, efficiency, or cutting edge products compared to the rest of the world. Let me take an example. Half of the 5G antennas in the world, half, 50%, are in China. Ericsson and Nokia have 3% of the Chinese market. They have 65 or 70 percent of the European market. Three, 65. The Chinese market generate the same amount of profit as the 65.
I know half of Finland is shareholders in Nokia, so I apologize for this statement. Maybe we can redact it uh, at the end of this uh, conversation. And this is kind of a showing the scale of the problem when it comes to the profitability. And we have a tendency also to over-regulate and make things complicated. The single market was created by deregulation. I'm not a huge fan of deregulation per se. I'm sort of a middle of the road. I mean, come on, I'm, I'm Scandinavian. <laughs> but we can't regulate ourselves into competitiveness. That's a fundamental mistake. And there is a concept in Brussels called the Brussels effect, which is based on the idea that whatever we do, the rest of the world will follow. That's simply not true. I was a part of the people who actually set up some of these standards as a diplomat and technical expert. I know how it worked. They were all done by the business, which the diplomats and the political supported. They were not created by politicians. And there are a good example of this, how the rest of the world, including my original home country, Japan, realized that they could never beat the European industry, not the European regulators, they could never beat the European industry in standard setting. That's why they decided to do a free trade agreement with us. If you can't beat them, join them. Right, so to wrap up, where are we? I think Agnieszka did a fantastic job in, in landscaping what we're seeing in front of us in terms of elections and what's happening on the, in the world right now. But I will say a couple of words, perhaps, which is that 2024 has been a tumultuous year. 40% of the world populations went into elections. They went to the ballot boxes. Notably, China, Ukraine, and Russia were not one of them. Anyway, uh, having said that, we have to also remember that the European elections don't create decisive outcomes that lead to major policy changes, hence the sleepwalking into disasters, until we actually manage to get our act together and do the unthinkable. We operate, the history of Europe is very much in zigzags, because we operate through policy failures. We have to hit the wall, but once we hit the wall, we get our act together. I think when it comes to competitiveness, we did hit that wall pre-COVID. We have been preoccupied with other things, that's for sure. But ultimately, this is a kind of a policy failure where the frog gets boiled slowly and there is a realization across the world. Not just in Europe, but globally. United States, if I look over there, uh, is doing, Biden administration has done infrastructure, uh, sorry, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which is the biggest state government funded industrial policy in the world. There are predictions that show that actually the energy prices in United States is converging towards zero as they go into, after the fracking revolution, they go into the renewable evolution. What does that actually mean? If you're in the chemical, aluminium, or in the semiconductor business, free electricity and the promise of a double-digit growth is going to do a lot. You relocate. Swiss and German solar panel companies have already said, we are flagging out. All European high-end SUVs made by Volkswagen and Mercedes, and they're made in the United States. Why? Productivity. So, United States actually remains perhaps our biggest rival, ironically. They compete against us on almost one-to-one -one on every product that we do. Boeing versus Airbus. Volkswagen versus Ford. Chinese BID, actually the electrical automaker, accounts for 0.1% of EU single market market shares. 0.1. <laughs> Talk about a giant that is afraid of its own shadow. Of course, this will grow in the same way that the, the Japanese and Korean auto manufacturers like Toyota and Hyundai began small and became large. 
But this is the uncomfortable situation of Europe because we are good at light manufacturing. We are good at all that stuff that emerging com countries want to make when they industrialize. The first thing you do as an emerging market is basically textiles and cars and a little bit of electronics. We are kind of screwed because after China, there will be others. And we're going to take hit over and over again because we are actually not moving our, from our position. So to maybe try to see what we, what we expect in the current political cycle, United States is not going to go anywhere. They are going to be still remain dominant and in the forefront in terms of not just productivity, but also in terms of fiscal firepower. And in a sense, trying to actually follow the United States and China in spending more money is not going to solve any problems. It's going to make the industry quiet, and, but it's not actually going to deliver the innovations that we need. What an EU commissioner once said uh, to me in private is that I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I have no choice but to throw a lot of money at nothing and hoping that something will come out of it. We don't have a great policy space, my friends. <laughs> and this is perhaps a very depressing read, but it's even worse for the others. Chinese are constantly struggling to reform their overcapacity, which is caused by their provinces. Uh, provinces are running businesses because in China, provinces are not allowed to tax. It always comes from the central government. It's the opposite of EU, where the member states have the right to tax and the EU doesn't have the right to tax. In a sense, both China and Europe is actually converging their fiscal model into something that is eerie similar. And to continue, um, in, if I look at international trade, there are really no good deals out there, simply because under inflation, there is no export-led growth. There's a lot of opposition against globalization for sustainability reasons, consumer protection, etc., etc. Every trade deal that we do now is going to be ridiculously expensive. By the way, that also goes for the treaty change in the EU. If you try to do it now, it will come at a very, very high price because our political leaders don't actually have the policy space to deliver what they need to do. It sounds like it's a very bad time to negotiate something. But there are some good news, I think. As strategic autonomy that is a fundamental concept for Europe has evolved into de-risking. But ironically, de-risking also means less profits. We can't, we need to de-risk from weaponization, but we can't de-risk from commercial risk taking. And here's where I think Europe's position can be summed up, and which is we crave the status quo. We want things to go back to how they were. That's perfectly normal. We run the world. The world before Russia's invasion, before Trump, before the collapse of the WTO, and when we're operating under the rule-based order, and we could trade with emerging markets. We had the free energy practically from Russia, and the new world were defending us for free. But there is a great danger in believing that this status quo can come back. And a friend of mine, who is actually a minister from Japan, uh, who said in his observation of Japan, in a paper he wrote to me, he wrote, when Europeans use their abundant knowledge to resist any changes to status quo, they should not expect a brighter future or that the next generation will be able to lead the enjoyable life that the current one has. And I think he has a point, because the problem is not attributed to business, government, or regulations. That's pretty easy to change, but it comes down to the mentality. It's a question of actually none of the areas that I'm expert in, law or economics. It's sociology. We have been dominant and a leader for a century and a half. It's not in our DNA trying to catch up. If someone surpasses us, we are more likely to think that they cheated. 
Now, I'm a great believer in bringing Europe to the world, but I think it's a time to bring the world to Europe. Uh, a lot of Europe, uh, sorry, a lot of Asian and American leaders tend to think that Europe is a little bit aloof in its ivory tower and living in a bubble. And I think there is a corner to be fought for Europe in reality, in that commercial rivalry that we are talking about. There is something that we can do if we are willing to say that actually the world doesn't actually play according to our rules. It, play, it has always played by its own rules. And we can still beat them. And here's where I come back to where Agnieszka was saying about her background as um, someone who grew up in Poland. I chose to be a European. Actually, my parents did. They migrated during the 80s. I was merely a teenager. My first job uh, after university was to advocate for Sweden's membership for the EU in the early 90s. Terrible job, I can tell you. But, <laughs> but with the moral authority of someone who has chosen to become European twice and three times by moving to Brussels, I would like to say that this is, there is something there worth fighting for. Thank you. Yes, Th thank you very much, and please take a seat for the, for, for the panel to, to follow. So we are uh, transitioning into the panel discussion now. Uh, we will focus on uh, challenges and trends impacting investments, innovation and know-how in Europe. And this panel has been organized uh, in cooperation with the Chamber of Commerce of Turku. I would like to invite on stage the panelists, Jani Pietikainen from European Investment Bank, CEO of Bonalive Biomaterials, Heidi Randala, welcome. And the Vice President of Sandvik, Saya Kuusisto Lancaster, welcome. So, uh, as a warm up uh, question, uh, I would like to, to ask the three of you at least uh, to, to introduce your kind of daily work, what you are doing uh, shortly, and then also invite you to, to give the kind of first comment to, to Hosuk's uh, keynote, if, if there's any initial thoughts that, 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 that rose up. Uh, Saya, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, nice to be here uh, to comment and reflect on, on, on my role. Vice President of Sandvik sounds excellent. <laughs> I'm, I'm Vice President in the Division Load and Hall of uh, mm. Sandvik Mining and Rock Solutions, uh, based here in Turku. Uh, working with strategy, uh, mergers and acquisitions especially, and in practice, uh, excitingly, today, very much shaping the future of mining through electrification from diesel fleet to battery electric, mm. zero emissions in the future. So, so that's what we are very much involved in, and I'm involved in, and with the cost of the presentation, very many reflections. Mm. And I think, uh, uh, I think what I got sort of got stuck with most was pretty much in the end about our Europeans as being used to being the forerunners and the first movers. And now we have to sort of realize that maybe that, that's no longer the truth and we have to actually keep up developing and innovating and, and, and admitting that we have to collaborate with the rest of the world. So I think something there really triggered my, my sort of a curiosity. Okay, thank you. Jani. Uh, yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jani Pietikäinen, and I'm the head of the Helsinki office, or the office covering Finland, uh, or, uh, of the European Investment Bank uh, Group. And uh, in my job, I, I, I coordinate the EIB's uh, activity here in Finland. Uh, our annual uh, financing in Finland is between one, uh, 1 billion and 1.5 billion. We finance public sector large corporates project finance uh, uh, and uh, offer uh, risk financing to, uh, to SMEs uh, through uh, intermediaries. Um, I, I, I think the, the point on, on the risk taking or the, or the Europeans not willing to take risk is, 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 a, is a very good one. Uh, the European Investment Bank, uh, until the Juncker Katainen plan, FC, which started 10 years ago, was very risk averse. 
our, our financing was mainly to large entities, investment grade uh, borrowers, big ticket loans with low risk. And then at that stage we understood that this isn't, this isn't enough for the European economy and we have started to take much more risk. Uh, financing is available from public banks, from commercial banks, if there's collateral and if there's low risk. But then in the high risk startups, project finance, there's a clearly a clear financing gap. And, and we, in our part, have tried to start to address this. Okay, thank you. Heidi. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Heidi Rantala, uh, working and leading a biotech company called Bonalive Biomaterials. And we are working in the trauma sector within the different indications and, and infections. So the health sector is the most probably the a bit uh, having a different kind of the finance in a regulation ground. So uh, I would love to maybe <laughs> emphasize a couple of different things from, uh, from the keynote. So the one is uh, regulations and bureaucracy. I would say that uh, if we found the bottom of it, uh, within the healthcare sector and within the MDR and other regulations. And maybe the one is also from Finland point of view is that not only the geographical distance is the one part, but we have a quite much challenges within the marketing and branding, like the commercialization of our product and ideas. So we are very good in reading, having these PhDs, and, and we have a long winter, so <laughs> we read a lot, and, and, and this is very good. We all, almost can make the research, as, as mentioned, and we can make the product, but somebody should like a commercialized market, mm. discuss, get it out of the borders, and brand, and these kind of things. This is not, not so usual for us, and in Finland especially, uh, even to compare to the other European. Mm. So this is... I think the two points from the keynote. Okay, thank you. Um, we are talking about competitive, competitiveness. Um, I, I was wondering, we have been uh, kind of also already discussing this a little bit and, and the, in the keynote as well, but if we are talking about research and development and, and, and innovation, uh, what is actually needed in, in order to be competitive? Um, in, in company level, business level, or, or, or in, in, in financing? What, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on this? Um, well, I think it all comes to people. <laughs> we need the resources. We need, their, we need their, 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 their people, the skills, the talent, also the future, future skills. We need their, um, uh, the, the sort of a setting for collaboration. Uh, the, I would say between within the within the companies, between the companies, between the companies, universities, or, mm. uh, research, or, and then of course also then eventually uh, uh, financiers. So I think it's a lot about the collaboration and, and the infrastructure and the, uh, how to actually make that happen. Yeah. What about you, Hedy? Yeah, I would repeat uh, the collaboration with the uh, different science parties and uh, universities, but that was the one challenge that we we have a lot of those ideas. We already have a lot of like uh, patents and these kind of things. So I, I would say that more financing uh, kind of the instrument that how we can change those instruments so we can really commercialize our product and and, and not just make the technology and funding and granting mm. technologies, but also get out of the building with the, the technology and get the certain finance instrument and funding from the governments directly to CEOs or from <laughs> Business Finland directly to companies that can really commercialize and not only like research or uh, invest, uh, innovate these uh, products. Jani, how, would, uh, how could we do that? Is, is there, or are we already doing that? Are there good instruments for companies like Bonalife available? Uh, I, I would like to believe so. Uh, and uh, of course, you, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I mean, we have a good cooperation with, uh, with Business Finland and the other Finnish uh, national promotional institutions like TESI, Finnish Industry Investments, and uh, Finvera. And uh, uh, of course, I mean, 
they they have they can show a path uh, for for gro for growth companies from research to late stage uh, series B uh, venture capital round, and that there are clear steps and clear pockets of funding both grants and loans, both Finnish and European. Mm -hmm. Is it perfect? Probably not. Is there a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of writing uh, applications, I'm sure. Uh, could it be made, made easier? I'm, I'm sure it could be. Uh, and as, as Hosuk mentioned, you know, there are a lot of rules, a lot of reporting, etc. So it, it's not perfect. But uh, I, I'm sure that there is, a, in the Finnish administration uh, and in the current government, there's a clear priority mm. to improve the access to finance and to have a clear growth path uh, for Finnish startups. But then it's again, a, it's the risk taking and, so, and the social and the uh, uh, need to find the entrepreneurs mm. who are willing to go that route. Even if the road is there, you need somebody to start walking it. Any reflections on, on the discussion so far, Hosok? Any thoughts that has risen? Well, I think the uh, the feedback from the business and the practitioners has been kind of evident to and very coherent in terms of what we're talking about. I just want to pick up on a couple of points because I really agree on the regulatory side. Uh, this is what I mean by you have removed the risk. We have the safest market in the world, but we have also the least profitable market in the world. The big European multinationals have effectively become banks because they made money in the past. Where does the money go? Overseas. If I look at, for example, the European telcos, they got a lot of European funding from the RRA, uh, RRA and, uh, which is the, um, the, the recovery fund. And uh, where did they invest it? Networks in the United States, mm. because that's where, where the profits are. They can only follow the, what the shareholders want, and they want better profits. And this is fundamentally a problem if you're a European worker. And also, just to add one point, I, because I agree really on we have a good R&D clusters, uh, we have a good regulatory structure, but we also need a little bit of regulatory stability. There has been a lot of regulatory innovation <laughs> You know, regulators have been the most innovative people in Europe in the latest years. And we have, I think, also sufficient funding to a lot of things that we like to do. But one thing that we also lack, I think, is what Americans and Chinese and the Brazilians and Indians have, is that the business have the backing of the diplomats and the regulators and their leaders. Economic statecraft, where basically economic objectives is in the heart of the foreign policy, and the foreign policy is also in the arms of the economic policy, is a reality. Americans and the Chinese are actually thinking every day of the week in terms of how to destroy European food safety standards, telecom uh, protocols, and not to mention the AI Act and a lot of other things that we have invented. This is the reality we live in. Heidi, would you go so far as to say that uh, regulation is a bottleneck for your company as in, in, in innovation and, and development? Thank you. Uh, I would say that is the probably the most challenging part uh, for the health industry in, the, in this situation. We have a new regulation in EU called uh, Medical Device Regulation, MDR. Uh, pharmaceuticals, they got more and more strict regulations. We got so much that we actually don't even able to implement it every time and now we have extended it and extended it and extended it and EU like and Brussels stay extended the time because of and because of and now we have waited like seven years to actually implement the law and re-registrations of the products so we wait and wait that we actually can utilize the law and, and this is something that is very challenging for the company to develop to change improve and do the things if we just wait to re-approve already existing products. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other bureaucracy and the regulations, they are very uh, anti-competitiveness uh, versus the other uh, like US, mm -hmm. because nowadays actually we are not anymore the safest in even with these regulations. You get plenty of different pathway 
to market, to get the market access in US, like a traditional breakthrough, fast track and these kind of things. But in EU, you get only like one track. It's very traditional. Nobody knows actually how the pathway now is going because there are new stakeholders on the ground. There are uh, notified bodies who make decisions according new law, how they read the law. So it's very unclear and it takes time, it takes a lot of resources. It's like a basketball game that you have every sales uh, person, you got own regulator person behind it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's quite challenging and resourceful and take a lot of time and oh. bureaucracy. And it is actually pushing your reason, pushing your, you to kind of at least consider to, to, to push your resources to outside. It demand resource yeah. a lot of because there are certain deadlines and, and more and more like reporting and more and more that we have five years ago or ten years ago yeah. and more and more resources is uh, needed in that regulation and, and the other regulations and standards and so on. So. I know a Belgium, actually a biotech startup. The first employee was a GDPR compliance officer. I, I, can, I can't imagine. <laughs> so, so this sounds uh, familiar to eerily, eerily familiar to you as well. Then, yeah. any uh, comments on this, Jan? Have you been uh, listening to? I mean, yeah. I mean, there are a number of Finnish startups that uh, you know that are have publicly said that okay, our first market is Singapore because we got the approval there first. Mm -hmm. and we are still waiting for the Europeans. Another one is going to uh, build the first factory in the U.S. because the U.S. Uh, uh, approval comes much faster than from, from, from the European agency. So, uh, yeah, it's clearly a problem. Um, but, I mean, at the same time, I mean, let's not get too gloomy. Yes, I mean, <laughs> let's not. I'm sure everybody has read the uh, strategic priorities of the new von der Leyen's commission and... Mm. Uh, if everything gets implemented, I mean, we will be the most competitive, competitive uh, region in the world. Uh, so, so therefore, I mean, there's a lot of work, work to be done. Uh, but uh, I think uh, let's start it. Yeah, and at least and we then, know. Yeah, at and least. then of course one, I mean, disclaimer: the European Investment Bank. We are a, a policy uh, taker, hmm. and the Commission is the policy maker. Absolutely. So we implement. Yeah. implement uh, policies and priorities of, of, of the Commission and the member states. Yeah. So I'm acting in my yeah. private capacity. At least we know where the, where the bottlenecks are, maybe. Yeah. So when we hit the wall, then we can, we can work on, on, on that. Uh, I would like to move on to another topic where we m might be quite good. So, so we were, oh, Hosuk was talking about basic research and, and, and we're doing that very well. Uh, I would like to ask, Saya, you, uh, you are doing your development mostly here in, in Turku and in Finland, right? And uh, how does your collaboration with the, with the science sector, science makers uh, work actually? And, and, and how does that uh, affect your, your uh, work on innovation and, and moving to, to electric? Yes, we do uh, have our biggest uh, R&D center here in Turku. Uh, however, we have some also in California, close to, close, close to Los Angeles. Mm collaboration between those two is for sure. Uh, I would say that yes, we have got good collaboration uh, with, their, with especially the schools around, around uh, in Turku. We are very much looking forward to uh, future, uh, even bigger scales collaboration now with, with, their, uh, with their engineering sector over there, uh, and knowing that they will also invest in, in, in resourcing around electric drive lines, for example, because we foresee a, a huge need of uh, skills and talent with regards to that field. And, uh, and, and therefore, actually having that now locally in Turku is, is great news, great news, and, and uh, something that we uh, really want to be engaged in. Mm. What about you, uh, Heidi? Uh, we have also kind of a similar picture that we have subsidiaries in, in Italy and German, but we also have uh, one subsidiary in, in Los Angeles. So in US, and that's, that is the marketplace that we are now heading a lot of, also, uh, as well as in Europe, because uh, this is the case uh, currently. But uh, within the research part, we have everything here in Finland, like research and, 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 and uh, R&D labs and, and manufacturing. But we do a lot of uh, like research, not only locally in Turku, but, uh, but within the uh, 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 different kind of the universities in Europe as well, in Italy or in 
uh, Holland or whatever. So we have a lot of this collaboration and I would say that this is our asset, that we have a very good like R&D here and very good innovation. And this is something that we need to get more and more uh, uh, collaborate with the network uh, uh, abroad. Do you find it easy to, to move from the basic research and the, and the kind of scientific research into, into actual products and, and move on from there to, to marketing and actually going into I, I would say that this is the gap that we have, that we have, a re, we have very good innovations and patents. We got a very good like research and funding for research to get these startups start but when it gets actual that the product is not you don't want to sell product i can't go uh, back a hospital door and say i got the product i really need to know the concept and commercialize where the product is used mm. i can't go the ear surgery and tell that i got the product for surgeons and then he tell yeah that's for orthopedics mm. so i really need to know the concept and the usage of the product and really commercialize who needs that how to need so it's marketing and a lot of communication and branding and knowledge so this is the cap that we talk about the product but the one who really needs it needs solution yeah. so this is i think is the cap that we don't sell the same that they are buying do, do you have the same kind of uh steep rise there or a gap? Sorry. Yes, pretty much. And I'm actually th- thinking about you saying about marketing and communication. And perhaps we already discussed that a little bit. But I do see that we have there a gap as, as perhaps Finns. I think we, we have a lot of skills. We have a lot of talent. We have a lot of good ideas, good innovations, perhaps prototypes. But we sort of keep it, we keep quiet. And we don't really boldly <laughs> talk about that to the bigger world. And when I'm comparing us, uh, for example, uh, towards the Swedes, uh, working in the Swedish company, I think Swedes do that a lot better. And then, of course, Americans, you know, they, they, they are bold and, and, and loud. So I think we could improve on that. <laughs> Is this a attitude uh, thing, Hosuk? I was just laughing about sweets. <laughs> 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 Now, uh, I think there is actually, uh, it's not all doom and gloom. Mm. Because I think in applied sciences, and for example in composite materials, and uh, not mentioned in uh, life sciences, we are really good at that stage of taking an innovation and commodifying it into a product. That the question is, why haven't we succeeded in emerging tech? Why can't we replicate this from applied research to commercialization in services, emerging technology? What are we doing wrong? Mm. And, and I think a number of things can be said, but I think we have to also be very honest about the fact that there, we did have national industrial policy in the 90s and the noughts, What, that were terrible, terrible bets. We kind of thought that maximizing supply and lowering prices while trying to maintain high quality, the German model, would save us all. It didn't. It turned out actually that what you should have scaled is not supply but demand. And this is where a lot of... Um, new technology companies as well as new business model flourished. And we kind of missed the train on that one because we put priority to things that turn out not to be the winner of the day. And to be fair, you know, uh, if you're an industrial planner, whether you're in Brussels or China, you know, if you have the ability to predict what the market is going to look like on a global scale in 10, 15 years, you are not sitting in the Berlamont building, you're working for a hedge fund. It's, the difficulty starts with the fact that regulators think that they can beat the market. Mm. They very rarely can. There are good examples where it has happened in the 70s and 80s. There are a lot of examples of industrial planning that is successful, and including here in Finland, the transition towards ICT that happened in the 80s is absolutely astonishing. It should be taught, in, well, it is taught in schools but it's very hard to replicate and assuming that we did that once and we were always going to be successful is a very, very dangerous recipe. Uh, we are, by the way, uh, closing to, to audience questions. So now it's uh, time to start thinking what you would like to ask the panelists. So in a couple of minutes, I will take a take couple of uh, audience questions as well. But uh, Jani, uh, 
talking about uh, the, the, the how, what's your point of view on, on this as, as you are working with, with businesses uh, is do you see the, the same gap we are doing uh, products well but not continuing very well from there or is this something that you have observed uh, I, I would say that I mean in, in Finland uh, the the startup uh, skiing uh, skiing is is very active, yeah. and, and I think that the the story that uh, the Swedes and the Americans are sort of overpowering our our companies, you know, with their uh, active marketing, etc. I mean, partly is true, I'm sure, but when you look at the younger generation, I mean, they from day one product or sort of an, uh, a plan and how to how to implement it globally. Yeah. So I, I think the, the uh, attitude has, has clearly changed uh, and, and there are entrepreneurs in Finland and they are serial entrepreneurs and there are angel investors uh, who provide funding and the know-how. So I, I, I think that we have, we have uh, this, this capacity and these entrepreneurs, but there aren't enough of them. Yeah. Uh, and the startup community, which uh, the plan is that uh, the uh, turnover of, of startups in Finland would uh, multiply by the 2030 is, 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 a, is a brave target. But I mean, we should clearly uh, aim at that and uh, work in the financial sector together with, with the startup community, of course, itself, and then with, with, the, uh, with the public sector. From your point of view, is there something that we can do to, to ease up uh, this uh, pushing forward uh, the products into into concepts and uh, solutions? Uh, one 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 issue that we haven't haven't touched, of course, is the, is the fact that then uh, venture capital funding there is seven times more VC funding in the US compared to Europe. Yeah, uh, and and clearly. E especially in the large ticket, in the late stage, we don't have big funds yeah. enough. And this is a, a market gap that the EIB group and especially its subsidiary European Investment Fund is trying to address so that these big uh, European champions, European unicorns would stay in European hands because now they are sold to US investors, VC funds too early. Uh, let's come back to, to financing after after, uh, uh, after a couple of minutes, but now it's time for audience questions. So at least, yep, there's one over there. And there's a mic. And please state your name and, and then th your uh, question. Natalia Alexeva, Dr. Natalia Alexeva from Free Russian, Forum of Free Russia. So first, before I am asking the question, I would like to convey deep credit to the company Bonalive Biomaterials. Uh, uh, directly from Ukraine, uh, namely the project Save the Limb to the Wounded. Uh, yesterday I had a brief conversation with the trauma uh, orthopedist from that project, and they asked me to be here and to say global thanks to deep global thanks to, to the company. Uh, it works, your product works. And, uh, you, you know, my question is how much your, let's say, customers can help to commercialize your products if we can do something for that. If it's possible somehow, if working customers, working, I mean, uh, where your product is working, where it helps to save uh, health, uh, normal life to young uh, soldiers from Ukraine, for example, if we can do something in, 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 in respect in, uh, for, for your company, for example. So if the, if the, uh, the uh, customer can help you somehow? Or yes, 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 of course, but uh, I can be... For advertisement or something like that. Yeah. We and, can't do a lot, but... And, uh, and maybe some uh, applause for the, for the thanks. <laughs> uh, can I uh, answer that shortly, that yes, we have a, a products and solution in Ukraine, mm. and we actually go to Ukraine three years ago, uh, exactly the reason that we can help shoulders back to their feet. And, and this is the case that we want to get uh, Ukraine, get uh, like rebuilding and give the health uh, part uh, like working better and better. 
and, and this is something that we are working on now, and actually we are working on directly with the Finnish government and other parties, so we can more and more help uh, the Ukraine uh, uh, with the products and, and solutions uh, within the young soldiers and other. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? We have time for one more at least. Yes, there's one over there. And uh, but let's wait for the mic. Kaisa Leivo, Turku Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Lee Makiyama, you mentioned that, the, that there are some problems and inflexibilities in the European labor market. Mm. And we even ten, tend to think that it's worse in Finland, that our labor market is very unflexible and uncompetitive. I would like to the sort of be a bit positive and ask both Heidi and Saya. You both work in companies which do profitable business here uh, with our labor market, with all the restrictions. What are then the strengths? I mean, what can we do if, if our labor market is not that that flexible and competitive as, for example, in the U.S. What, what are our competitive, our business competitive factors then? Thank you for the question. Um, I think a couple of reflections. Uh, overall, uh, I think things uh, work well in Finland. Uh, we have a uh, good education, uh, uh, good resources available, uh, talent, uh, uh, young people are eager to, to learn and develop uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, perhaps, uh, just a reflection around the, the discussion during the summer about uh, you know, age discrimination and making sure that people over 55 get employed or making sure that uh, I would say all kinds of resources are, are, are getting uh, access to work. For example, um, uh, we uh, struggle to find uh, female engineers. Uh, we would very much like to have more women working in our, our industry and our company, and, and uh, that is something that we could probably do more uh, uh, as, as within Sandvik, but also you know, uh, through collaboration between, between different parties. I think, I think uh, perhaps uh, deeper into the uh, age thing, um, I think it would be fun and, and really, really uh, practical, uh, useful, useful to have uh, perhaps uh, fle more flexible uh, hours and, and solutions for, for people getting closer to retirement, not having to work every day from eight to four and, and, and sort of a continuous basis throughout the year, but perhaps more assignments, projects. Uh, come come when, you, when you have time and when you want to do a couple of hours and go back and do something else. So these kind of things would probably, probably be useful and help. Uh, I would very much agree that uh, different kind of expertise is the one that we have been utilized that have a very uh, grounded experience. And, and in here in Finland, this is uh, quite good in education and everything. But uh, maybe we have uh, our experience is more that we have taken a lot of risks mm. and, and we have a, a lot of like, strength within the taking the risk. Uh, within the private equity or within the technology, but also I would say that within the people that we have, uh, they are willing also to get abroad. Mm -hmm. so, so within this kind of maybe uh, education is more needed that where you want to head up, not just like investigate again here, but how you want to get it brave and risky enough to fly to Brazil and have this discussion with the distributor or fly to Ukraine and have this discussion. Mm. So, so we need to get out of building. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Jani was talking about financing to, just before the questions, and Hosok, I would like to ask you to, to a little bit comment on, on, on what, what he was saying. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, financing do we need more? Is there something that you should do or could do to, to uh, kind of push the innovation uh, in businesses forward by, by, by financing. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I largely agree uh, with analysis that, yes, we, we are short on risk capital, and mm -hmm. there are very good reasons. There, there, there's no risks to pursue, as we said. Uh, but also, I would like to come back to the question around, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to say that this model or the, um, the more rigid uh, Scandinavian uh, labor market model mm. is somehow bad, if I may have given a, exp that, that perception. It's a choice. We can't have the cake and eat it, which means that if you have chosen that path or, let's say, uh, 
removing risk capital from the market and diminishing it and expand the role of the banks, then you need to have a plan on how to basically spur entrepreneurship and innovation. And uh, in the same way, when it comes to the, the labor market question, um, I mean, first of all, I have to laud Finland uh, for its education system. I mean, if my, my parents are gone now, but I'm pretty sure that you know, if they have to make the choice today, I'm pretty sure that they will be Finnish uh, rather than Swedish. That's absolutely dead certain because they, they, they did look at the education system and sort of think, where do we want to retire? We want to, we want to build a better future. And the first thing you look at the education system. Uh, I'm not going to answer if I would be accepted and if that would be a wise choice or not, because obviously I'm, I'm, I'm a deadbeat sitting in Brussels, non-productive, and uh, what you're saying about 55 scared the living daylight out of me because I'm a couple <laughs> of years away from 55 <laughs> and I'm constantly facing unemployment. But there is a lot of, if I look at, for example, the Danish and the flex security, uh, that's, um, and what we have seen now in various type of reforms, that's quite an interesting model. And um, entrepreneurship and risk is built by people who have nothing left to lose. That's why every one of the, you know, the tech bros at college dropouts didn't have a choice but to succeed. Mm. And in the same way, if I look at the, the, the financing and the funding side, uh, it just can't be that the funding goes to the company that has the best lobbyists that's what's happening in the United States right now, and that's happening to the, in China. There's a huge debate within the, the PRC whether they should go with the state-owned companies or whether they should, they should go with the private companies. And this is going to be a huge problem in the 2027 leadership change because they has basically split into two different fractions. And we have a similar kind of logic here. We have a pressure from the voters and the CEOs. They want free money too. Maybe we should think about where they are going and how we want, how is that going to actually achieve competitiveness in Europe? And as I mentioned, there's a lot of dead spillover going to other markets out of Europe simply because we can't generate the corporate profits that the shareholder wants. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left and I would like to pose a, a, a kind of a, a final question to, to all of you. And, 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 and uh, the question is, uh, what, would you, what would be your message to the policymakers, either, either in, here in, in Finland or in, in you, if you have to pick one message that you would like to, to, to push forward? What would, what would you say? Go ahead, Saya. Perhaps I'll go back to the education and the Finnish school system, if I, I zoom into Finland. Uh, we have had uh, one of the best schools uh, systems uh, in the world for ages and, and, and based on media, uh, based on reflections, uh, unfortunately it seems like we are sort of edge of losing that. Uh, teachers say that the kids no longer can read, they can do the basics of maths. Mm. So how can we then expect that in 20, 30 years we will have people who, who are skilled in those fields? So, so let's do something together to prevent that from happening, to maintain the, the high level of education. Okay. Okay. Well, something that struck me uh, that actually Jani was talking about is that how we are going to, if we just execute the von der Leyen plan, we are going to be the most competitive region in the world. <laughs> you know what? I'm old enough to remember the Lisbon agenda. We were going to be the most competitive economic region by, what was it, 20, 2010? Yes. Did that happen? Well, it, it depends. I mean, this is how it always works. Um, whatever that's on the table, <laughs> By the time we have achieved a goal, that's it. You know, we, d we haven't really defined what net zero is, but because by the time we actually reach the deadline, and whatever we look like, that is going to be the net zero. And this is the lack of political accountability in the EU system. We don't have parties. And every leader set a deadline that is two, three years after his or her retirement. Convenient, huh? <laughs> And since you, there is no accountability and for a failed plan, we have some of the best diagnostics in the world that we do collectively. But we have always the wrong prescription. It's not even the wrong prescription. There is no prescription. Basically, we are saying that we're just going to continue to do whatever we always wanted to do and we plan to do anyway. And somehow that's going to be magically change us. And in a sort of like a sadomachistic way, 
I do hope for that policy failure when we are waking up and said, this doesn't hold. And I see that happening in France uh, that I admire quite a lot and also in the Scandinavian countries. They said, normal is not there. Yeah. Let's stop being nostalgic. Okay, Jani. Uh, I, w- I was listening to uh, Prime Minister uh, Orpos' uh, European policy speech yesterday, and uh, he mentioned three priorities for Finland in the next MFF, where Finland would like to see more funding. And they were uh, Ukraine, uh, Horizon Europe <coughs> program, and uh, InvestEU. And it happens that the European Investment Bank Group is the implementer of the InvestEU budget guarantee program, which allows us to... Uh, increase our risk-taking, support SMEs, green transition, uh, innovation in particular. So so there is clearly, there is a role for a public financing to to address the financing gaps. So uh, we fully support Finland's position and uh, and, uh, hope that when the MFF proposal comes next summer that there will be more funding for InvestEU because that allows us to do more good work for Europe. Sounds good. Heidi? That's then a very good opportunity to review all the bureaucracy and, and, and the reporting and guidances for finance. So I, I think this is the one that now the real uh, bureaucracy workshop is needed, what are really needed for this funding and, and the mentality part of the companies, mentality part of Finnish people, are we tolerating if there are not that much uh, guidances and instructions anymore? Mm-hmm. Can we tolerate that as well? So this is the very good the moment to review the bureaucracy and guidance and instructions. Okay, thank you very much. And let's give a warm applause to, to our panelists. Thank you. you can... Okay, thank you all for participation and engagement in this session. I hope you have found insights from the discussion today. And as we conclude, I would like to wish you all a very productive rest of the day. Thank you.